What's your biggest goal for the rest of your life? Or to put it another way, what do you really want to see happen? Or to put it even another way, what would take place in your life that would cause you to say, well, now I can die? We don't even want to call it a spiritual bucket list because bucket list has become part of our commonplace language. The things you check off before you die. But what I'm asking you is what is the quest of your heart? Because the Apostle Paul says some astounding things here. And he does some contrasting with the achievements of life compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ. The real pursuit of your life changes when you encounter the glory of Christ. Please stand for the Word of God. Eleven wonderful verses here. And again, make this your own this week. Please consume the Word of God. The Word of the Lord. Finally, my brothers, rejoice in the Lord. To write the same things to you is no trouble to me and is safe for you. Look out for the dogs, look out for the evildoers, look out for those who mutilate the flesh. For we are the circumcision who worship by the Spirit of God in glory in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh. Though I myself have reason for confidence in the flesh also. If anyone else thinks he has reason for confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews. As to the law, a Pharisee. As to zeal, a persecutor of the church. As to righteousness under the law, blameless. But whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the, as, because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake I have suffered the loss of all things, and I count them as rubbish, in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the resurrection from God that depends on faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and may share his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, that by any means possible that I may attain the resurrection from the dead. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please be seated. Three principles. Nothing new there. But please hear this. God's word is always new and fresh. Last week, just as a side note, I felt God was speaking in such a powerful way. And that of all my years at Faith Church, I don't remember so many distractions happening at one time. There was a spiritual element to it. There really was. And including me trying to think in my car. It wasn't my car alarm going off, but somebody's alarm. So, I say to you as God speaks and reveals His glory, mute your cell phones, deal with your car alarms, and let's not allow anything to hinder the Word of God. Amen? It, it was really wild. And God was speaking. And, I, I, and I'm going to say this very strong. I think it was a satanic diversion. Now, if you hit your keys and the alarm goes off, no, you're not an agent of Satan. It's just that there's you, something else is taking place when you meet Christ. And the evil one hates it. And so all start all there's ladders coming in here and fuses blowing up all the same time. What does that tell you? All right? So anyway, the, we're not here to have a lot of rules, but the one thing has to be cell phones muted. The only time I'm ever separated from my cell phone is during my worship hour. That doesn't make me more spiritual because I live and breathe it. And uh, but just let's remember that. All right, amen. All right, three principles this morning. When you encounter Christ, there's a huge change. And I'll break this down so to be crystal clear, Lord willing. You change your resume, your justification for living, your resume, from self-justification 
I've done a good job to the gospel. All right? Second, you change your boasting. What's important in my life is what I've done. You change your boasting from your achievements to the gospel. Thirdly, you change your pursuit, what I want out of life, to gaining Christ and being found in Him. There it is. That's enough for the rest of your life right there. So let's begin. We've got a lot of ground to cover. Change your resume from self-justification to the gospel. The Apostle Paul is giving you his resume here in Philippians 3. And he's saying if you want to compare righteous achievements, try messing with me. I mean, he had unimpeccable religious qualifications. And he's doing battle with a group of what were called Judaizers, which he addresses in depth in the letter to the church at Galatia, the Galatians epistle. And they were good people, but they were insisting on certain facets of the old covenant, i.e. circumcision. They're saying this gospel of Christ is wonderful, but don't you dare ever, ever do away with parts of the old covenant law which they put on the same level of the gospel. Instead of saying, what, whatever, no big deal, the Apostle Paul called them what? Dogs. Now, I loved my dog. My dog. And in the ancient world, dogs were not always thought upon with such pet lovingness. All right? And so he's, that's not a compliment when he says, you mutilators of the flesh, you dogs. He's saying you are blocking people from seeing and experiencing the clarity of Jesus Christ. They were insisting on these matters for salvation. It's almost like when I was growing up in the early days of the Jesus movement. I know that ages me. Our church was very uptight. And I love my church, by the way. Our church was very uptight with allowing long hairs to attend worship. We did not allow bands or guitars. That was a fundamental principle of our existence. Drums, even on Youth Sunday. But very uncomfortable with hippies coming to worship. And we would raise the question, what does that have to do with preaching the gospel? They were insisting that if you come to our church, you had to dress a certain way. Now, Presbyterians have always felt kind of like that. But this was more than that. If you want to know Jesus, you must do A, B, and C. The Apostle Paul said, Ooh, you are messing with the very integrity of the gospel. So how do you change your resume? Let's get back to the basic. What is your resume? It's what you think is important in your life. It's how you present yourself to God. It's your religious achievements. It's really the, the language that most people in our culture use when you ask if they're going to heaven. Now, those who believe in heaven, and there's still a huge percentage which say, I've lived a good life. I've done better than my neighbor. I, I've, I haven't uh, smoked, drank, chew, go with girls that do. I'm there. It's, my, it's the way I've lived my life. It's the intrinsic religiousness of our culture. It's a resume based on what you do to get God to do something. And the Apostle Paul says, you want to look at a resume? Look at me. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, the chief tribe. A Hebrew of Hebrews as to the law of Pharisee. Wow. As to a zeal, a persecutor of the church. And as to righteousness under the law, blameless. So that's what religion does. We... Make ourselves look as good as humanly possible. Like a photo crop. You ever know what a photo crop is? In a resume, you want to look better than you normally look? No? Well, I can give you a great example that people in our denomination think is absolutely hysterical. It's a picture of me that sits right out in the narthex there. They'd say, that is so amazing. It only if it looked like you. <laughs> and people come in, they say, it's one of the funniest things I've ever seen. They can do anything with a picture. You know, any blemish is gone. You say, obviously you're not going to have pimples in your photo crop. You know, they, they miss, my eyebrows are perfect, my hair. 
everything. It's not really me, but it's a photo crop. That's what a religious resume looks like. See what I put forward? Lord, I will do this and you do that. And the Lord says, okay. But that leaves you far from me and the Gospel. One teacher put it this way. The Christian faith is the only religion, quote-unquote, where you begin to repent of your righteousness as well as your sins. In other words, when you come to know Christ, you used to repent of your sins to try to make peace with God. Now you repent of your righteousness. All the things that you conjure up to somehow gain intimacy with God. Let me tell you, look at all the world religions, there's two choices. Self-salvation, and that can be religious or irreligious. Self-salvation and Christ's salvation, the Gospel. And so the Apostle Paul calls them dogs for a reason. Anything that camouflages the beauty and the clarity of God's coming in Christ and the offer of salvation is anathema. The Apostle Paul said the same thing that Martin Luther said. He said, if anything could have, anyone could have gotten to Christ on his own merits, would have been me. That's a pretty strong statement, but Luther was a zealous monk. But he said, the closer, the harder I climbed, the further I got from God. Until that bell rang that began the Reformation which you'll see right here again in this chapter, of a righteousness not of God, but from God that is given to me in Jesus Christ. And so, the gospel needs to be preached again and again and again and again. I talked to a young woman this week, and I don't know how the subject got around to church. Because sometimes I stay undercover in conversations. Because as soon as I admit to someone I'm a pastor, the conversation changes. I, I stay undercover as long as I can. Yes, I fake it. Sometimes. Now, I'll talk about Jesus. I just don't want to tell him I'm a pastor and blow the conversation. Because immediately it turns religious. But somehow I must have slipped. And I said something about working on a church staff, and she froze. And she said, oh boy, that word. And you know what she did? And she, that's the default mechanism ball where she says, oh, I just feel so horrible now. She said, I haven't been giving my tithe. I said, I didn't ask you about a tithe. I just said I worked on a church staff. She said, I haven't been worshiping. I just, oh, and this long litany of religious woes. And she'd had a hard life. Spent some time in prison for drugs. And... Um, so I kind of I offered just an encouragement, and I said, uh, "Well, don't you?" And this is not a technical theological thing. I said, "Don't ever let go of God, as if you can." But it's a figure of speech. Don't ever ever give up on God or something. And she said, "Oh no, I could never do that. He's all. He's my whole life. That was beautiful, by the way. He's my life." But then she said something very interesting that reminds me of religious people, and me too. She said, "Oh, but my life." She said, I'm not one of his favorites, but he's everything to me. I said, what did you just say? Why would you say you're not one of his favorites? She said, well, you don't know one-tenth about my life. I said, but are you in Christ? She hadn't quite heard that. If you're in Christ, you possess the righteousness of Christ, righteousness from God, and you may have made your entire life a mess, but you're not one of his favorites based on your own life merit. You may never have heard the gospel. I didn't say all that I should have. What do you mean you're not one of his favorites? Paul called himself the chief of all sinners. Try to measure up to that. And if you're in Christ, he sees you covered in the righteousness of Christ. Huh? Now, part of what she was saying was, I've had a really hard life. I'm not a very religious person. I don't even give money right now. So she's weighed down by that. I'm saying that's what the law will do to you. 
That's what Satan will do to you and accuse you again and again and again and again. Weigh you down, weigh you down, weigh you down. But the gospel brings freedom. So many church people have never heard the gospel. Many of you may feel, I'm not one of God's favorites. I don't do that much. I just, I'm kind of a mess. I've made poor decisions. Da 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 da. Maybe you need to hear the gospel this morning. And on the flip side, the Apostle Paul was a Pharisee and did everything properly. And he's saying you can be blameless. He wasn't technically blameless, but so to speak, compared with his neighbor. You can be blameless and be far from God. You can be blameless and far from God. To change your resume from self-justification. These are the things I do to get to heaven. These are the things I do to make God do something for me. This is not karma. What goes round goes round. That's the religious stuff of this world. This is something very different. All right, that's the first principle. Second principle. Change your boasting from your achievements to the gospel. Now, Paul is a writer. He's a brilliant scholar. And it has been said that even if he had not had the dramatic conversion on the road to Damascus, as a student of the teacher Gamaliel and others, he would have been, he would have been renowned as a scholar. So Paul is very particular with words. He's a writer. <laughs> the, the, the epistle to the Romans is considered one of the greatest masterpieces ever written. Okay? And so when he uses language that is so outrageous as he does here in these following verses, it is something that you need to behold. And I'm picking up at, with verse 7 here. And I'm kind of 7, 8, and 9 are all together. They're going to overlap in the second and third principle. But this is a man who had achieved great things. And by the way, the Pharisees took pride in persecuting the church because they felt the church blasphemed the holiness of God by playing games with Jesus as the Son of God. Until what? Jesus revealed Himself on the road supernaturally to the Apostle Paul. But here's where, here's where he talks about boasting. Again, notice not just the nuance of language, but how drastic this is. But whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Now here's where it gets verse 8 over the top. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For His sake, I have suffered the loss of all things. Oh my. And I count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ. Now the default mechanism in the human heart says, this is what I've achieved. I've done this. I've, I've built a life. In the old days, I pulled myself up from the bootstraps. I've raised a family. I've built a company. I've gone to church. I've served as an elder. Key word there, I. But this goes even further. This is the Congressional Medal of Honor. This is the Pulitzer Prize. This is the Purple Heart. Things that anyone would pride themselves in having. You would do anything to protect those rewards. And he doesn't even speak of it in a balanced way here to say there's some great things in life, but this is so much better. The Apostle Paul, this articulate writer, says... I consider all things as loss, and that's not enough. He says, I compare them to human excrement. All the translations have to use different words here. Really. There's no other way to translate the Greek than that. I'm not going to say what we would say. So don't worry. Breathe easy. Human excrement. The apostle Paul, that's over the top. But he doesn't just compare it to human action. He says, what? Hear this. Compared to the -the over-the-top, it means magnified or surpassing worth of knowing Jesus Christ as my Lord. For what? For whose sake I've lost all things. Now, my problem in life is I haven't lost all things. Honestly, I cling to so many things. The Apostle Paul made a clear break. 
because of the radical coming of Christ. And he considered everything else as human excrement compared to. He's not saying the wards of life are meaningless. That's not what the text is saying. He's saying compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Jesus Christ my Lord for whose sake I have lost all things. Now, we could spend weeks on this. Every time we sing that hymn, by the way, this morning, I have a hard time singing it. I noticed a lot of you were singing, I'd rather have Jesus in silver or gold or to be a king of this world. Wow, my heart. Whew. Silver and gold is very captivating. I, I, I kind of need feel like we need to be warned before we sing something like that. I'd rather have silver and gold than for the next 10 years sometime. I mean, that's a radical statement. And we're just singing, and I'd rather have Jesus because George Beverly sung that. Right? You'd rather have Jesus? What are you saying? That's what the Apostle Paul is saying. But that's a worshipful statement. He hated the church. But Christ broke through. Part of it is this. This surpassing knowledge or greatness of knowing Christ Jesus as Lord. He's saying, I have encountered true glory. Up until this point, my heart has settled for wonderful things. Achievements. Satisfactions of this life. Knowledge. Studies. Academic achievement. But now I've encountered true glory. And glory is weight. Glory is beauty. Glory is God's character. It's what our hearts are craving. What we long for after we die. What we're waiting for. What motivates us. I have now encountered glory. That's what the Apostle John said. The same thing. We have what? beheld His glory. We've seen it. The glory of the only one, that's a capital O, sent from the Father, full of grace and truth. All right. You want to know ecstasy? He's saying you can know that. Now, the question, well, was, you say, how can I know Jesus that way in this life? I know that, I, all right, I'll buy into the fact that I can know Him after I die like that. But there's something in this life which makes it very difficult, and you are so right, because our hearts are so captivated by anything other than the beauty of Christ. But that's why we worship. That's why we gather. That's why we pray. That's why we wait for a breakthrough. That's why we never, ever, ever give up on the Word. That's why we continue to seek true glory in Christ. And we begin to put our lives in perspective. We don't say, darn it, I graduated from college. What a terrible thing. No, 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 no. But we begin to put it all into perspective. Some of you have had great success in business. Some of you have lost a lot of money. Ultimately, it doesn't matter if you know Christ. Do you see that? And I could say to you, sometimes your loss is your greatest gain. I say tongue-in-cheek without sarcasm. I feel sorry for people who have never lost large amounts of money. You say, why would you say that? Because there's something about trusting Christ through the loss of money. Yes, I have known that. That draws you to a deeper walk with Christ. I feel sorry for people who have never known real failure. Because that failure can lead you to an open space in your walk with Christ. And that failure can force you out of your own boasting and religiosity so that your own justification, I've gone to church all my life, I'm doing this, I'm doing that, now becomes, it doesn't matter what I've done, it matters what He's done. And it matters that I've opened my life to the glory of His coming. And yes, I declare bankruptcy. Spiritual bankruptcy. And when I declare bankruptcy, my debt is paid. And yes, in this case, when I declare bankruptcy, not only is my debt paid, but His righteousness, which I don't deserve, is credited to my account. Do you see that? Oh, and what do I boast in? Great 
been an honor to be here for 20 years. I do boast about that sometimes. I say, you pastors jump around all the time. Ha, ha, ha. I've been here 20 years. That changed that. That's by the grace of God. By the grace of God. You see, I boast in the mercy, the provision, the glory of God, the salvation He's given. That's what I boast in. Some of you are successful. Some of you are not. Who cares? It's the person who understands the gospel. Who knows glory. Boast in the achievements of Christ. For whose sake I have lost all things. All right. Now you spend the rest of the week chewing on this. Chewing on like a dog chews on a bone. A lot about dogs in this sermon. Thirdly and finally... Change your pursuit. Remember that bucket list, this is what I want out of life. To gaining Christ and being found in Him. Here's this, this great section that I told you verses 10 and 11 is kind of a life mission statement. It is really. This is a great memory verse. Okay, go back to 8 again. Indeed, I count everything as lost for the surpassing knowledge of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For His sake I have lost, I've suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ Now, here we go. And be found in Him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, okay, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God, key phrase, that depends on faith. And here's the beautiful part. That I may know Him and the power of His resurrection and may share in His sufferings, becoming like Him in His death, that by any means possible, I may attain to the resurrection of the dead. All right. Now, Paul's not saying this might happen or I've got to try to get it on my own. That's not the thrust here. But he's saying this inheritance, which is mine in Christ, only in Christ. Now, what is that inheritance again? Everything that Christ has obtained in this great transfer, all that He receives from the Father all the glory that is bestowed upon Him, all of His victory, all of His reigning, ultimately is gifted, granted, credited to those who are in Him. For your life is hidden with Christ in God. And when Christ appears, you will appear with Him. How? In glory. So my salvation is that I'm in Him, not in myself. I'm a mess on my own. One teacher put it, suppose you had a terrible Tuesday. You can sin on any day, not just Tuesdays. Suppose you really messed up this past Tuesday. You say, what do I do? You, you, you repent and you, your heart is broken because you've damaged your father's heart. You've damaged him, but you haven't, haven't damaged your salvation. Why? Because my standing before God last terrible Tuesday was not based on my righteousness. I could never stand before a holy God in my righteousness. My standing is on the basis of Christ's righteousness. And my position, my status legally and spiritually is what? In Him. So I go back to my Father and say, I confess my standing in You. And this week, Tuesday is going to be a little better. And Wednesday too. You can throw in Thursday if you want. If you get that far, huh? See, I don't stand before a holy God on the basis of my righteousness. I would crumble. Absolutely crumble. I can't compare to the Apostle Paul. Tribe of Benjamin. Huh? Pharisee? Those guys were tough. And boy, did Jesus have some battles with them. Now, I, I want you to just think about something here. How do I gain Christ? Here's the question I know you're asking. How do I gain what is already a gift? Don't gain it by religious striving. You gain it by unwrapping this gift every day of your life before you enter eternity. You gain it by appropriating it and make it your own. You drink from this fountain of grace. You admit that your heart is constantly seeking false idols. And you confess your new status in Him. You gain Christ by knowing Him and experiencing Him and loving Him and being enthralled in Him and letting Him dry your tears 
letting Him come to you in your deepest shame. You gain the grace of God by living for Him now and allowing Him to explode in your heart. Do you see that? And part of what the Apostle Paul says, what do you want to do with the rest of your life other than take a cruise around the world and make money and make sure you have enough and hopefully keep the grandkids out of trouble? Those are nice things. Make sure that you don't have too many weeds in the garden and then eventually you live in a place that you don't have to do your own gardening. Yep. Have some money to leave to the kids. Maybe. Is that your life goal? Yep. What else is there? The Apostle Paul says, My passion is I want to know Christ and the power of His resurrection in me. The fellowship of sharing in His suffering. And then somehow, He's not saying this might happen, it's a figure of speech in the midst of all that to attain to the resurrection of the dead. Now that's the goal for my days. Now I know you, you probably want me to skip over this one part. It's not that easy. Verse 10 begins so well. I, mean, I want to know Christ in the power of His resurrection. And then it says, in sharing in His sufferings. Becoming like Him in His death. What in the world? What does that mean? I know I've been asking it too. Sharing in His sufferings is the brokenness of this world. And it is whatever brokenness we are called to face. Whether it's our own battle with cancer or if it's our deep commitment and empathy to the absolute horrid conditions of this world, the brokenness that Christ comes to restore a broken world, we share in His suffering. Now, the harder part is what? Becoming like Him in His death. What does that mean? Christ said what? Not my will, but Thy will be done. Take this cup away from me, but I will walk the Via Della Rosa in faithfulness. Now here's what he's saying. Some of you are walking a very challenging road right now. It's a difficult road. It's a road that you wish would go away. And Christ was relentless as He faced the cross. He set His heart and His face towards Jerusalem. And so becoming like Him in His death does not mean that we become a personal Savior for ourselves on the cross. It just means that in the darkness, in the valley, as we walk through the valley of the shadow of death, we walk another step. Some of you have need the grace of God just to take one more step at times. One more step, one more step, one more step. I, I've been telling you about my friend Gordon and what that, the impact it's been on my life, and I'll probably be talking about him for the next year, so that's how I'm learning of suffering and death just like I did my mother, so hang in there. The news gets worse and worse and worse, and his cancer is stage four. The doctor calls it dreadful. It's everywhere. It's relentless. It's on the march. It's maybe 12 months. And as I hear my dear friend on the phone, and I can't even speak, I'm so overwhelmed by this potential loss. And he talks about Christ and glory and praying for his family and praying for his family and praying for his family. And he says, I'm going to hang in there and walk another step. I said, Lord, why? This is horrible. And he says, hang on another step. Become like him in his death. That Jesus said, all right. This, I don't know what it would be like to die of brain tumor over a year. And I'm going to pray that he'd be healed, by the way. Uh, but it's such a relentless camp there that God may have other plans. If you'd join me in that, it would mean a great deal. But Lord, I'm going to walk this hard road filled with the presence of Christ. Do you see that? And then somehow, by the glory of God, when it all falls apart and my brain is eroded and I can't speak and I'm literally disintegrated, I will attain to the resurrection of the dead. Now that's enough to make a Presbyterian run around the block five times. So move ahead 
And by the way, when you walk the Via Della Rosa, the valley, the hard road, walk it with someone else whose road is very dark. Take somebody by the hand because your life is crystal clear. You're no longer willing just to put in time until we have a memorial service for you. You say, I want to know Christ and be found where? In Him. And His inheritance will be mine. And please hear this final thought. His inheritance will be mine. And that is far better than anything else this world could ever offer. Then I can sing with George Beverly. I'd rather have Jesus than silver or gold. Let's pray. Oh, Lord God, uh, your word is powerful. It is captivating. It is it is moving. It is surgery. It takes our idolatrous hearts that are craving life and caught up in ourselves and drowning once again. And your strong, certain hand lifts us up and gives us the gospel once more. Father, our resumes are all about us and what we've done. But this morning in Christ, we change that to the gospel. And in doing so, we submit ourselves to you. And we declare spiritual bankruptcy. We transfer all the filth of our lives to the cross of Christ. And in this double transfer, we receive back the very finished work of Christ's righteousness and the beauty of Christ. We change our boasting on all the things we've done from our achievements to the gospel. We consider it as dung, as human excrement, compared to, compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Jesus Christ as our Lord. And then we change our bucket list, our pursuits, our, our passion to gaining Christ and being found in Him. And if you've never ever experienced salvation in Christ, the Apostle Paul in Philippians 3 is laying out the beauty of the gospel. For a man who thought he had everything and realized he had nothing apart from Christ. So if you sense that supernatural tug on your heart, which by the way takes place in every believer's life as you see Christ in the gospel. But those of you that are outside of Christ, you're being brought in right now. And the Holy Spirit is regenerating your heart. And you say, what do I do? You pray this prayer. It doesn't have to be perfect words, but it has to be a heartfelt prayer. Lord Jesus, I need you. Lord, I need you. If the Apostle Paul needed salvation, I can't even imagine how much I do. But I confess my spiritual bankruptcy. I have nothing to bring to this. I am desperately in need of your grace. God, be merciful to me, a sinner. And I receive Jesus Christ and His completed righteousness on the cross. And it is transferred to me. And in doing so, the very life of God resides in my soul as a deposit, as a foretaste of the coming glory. I invite you, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, by the power of the Spirit, to live in my soul. If you prayed that prayer, you have come from death to life. And salvation is yours. Please let someone know. And Father, for those of us who name the name of Christ, thank you once again for raising us from the dead this morning. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Amen.